I started working at uh, BET after that. Wow. What 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 show? Or were you behind the I scenes? I was uh, I was working in the music department. Oh, okay. And um, I was only working there because I had to have a job on federal probation. How'd you get connected to BET? Um, I I used to sit on Donnie Donnie Simpson's couch, you know, with a father MC, you know, with my brother, oh. you know, say with Rachel. So I knew that's, people there. That's dope. And um. I wanted to host Rap City, but they had Tigger doing it. So they Tigger, was like, fuck yeah. it, I'm going to give you a job, right? Tired so, of them rejecting you, man. Yeah, they was rejecting man. me. Damn, all silk. My, all yeah, my yeah, life, yeah, I had to host Rap City show, is silk. <laughs> silk. I don't think you remember me. <laughs> all my life, I had to fight. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> all of it. <laughs> so, um. Uh, I, I, I started. Yo, all right, all right, all right, okay, let's go. All right, I started working there, and um, I remember my my PO used to tell me to come stick my head outside to make sure I was a, I had a real job. Oh, okay. because they used to come by the studio Damn. when I didn't have a job, and they smelled weed smoke. They was like, "Nah, you got to get a job to get a check." And I I remember sitting in the cubicles, man. It was like some shit I didn't want to do. I was I worked in the music department. Yep. Uh, with Kelly G and Tuma Bassa. Tuma is a good friend of mine, Kelly G. And um, I was responsible for the videos, which videos went into uh, medium rotation, uh, high rotation, uh, uh, low rotation. This is on, video soul days? On, no, 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 this is 106 and Park. 106? Ah. Yeah, 106 and Park, yeah. right? So um, it, was, it was just a monotonous job, man. I was like, this is not something I want to do. Hmm. And I always say this to people. You could chase your pension or chase your passion. It's up to you. I heard that shit. And That's I, a good I decided one. a real good one, right? I decided to chase my passion, man, because I remember being in that cubicle and sneaking out to auditions and, 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 and my boy saying, where your black ass at? Where you at? Where you at? <laughs> it's, it, you got to get these videos down. I'm like, yo, I couldn't take it no more. Yeah. So one year became two years, three years became four years, then it became 16 years. I was just there. Sitting in my cubicle, just 16 16 years, years. 16 years, just working there, man, just not happy. And I, and I, 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 you know, everybody was like, oh, you work at BET. But it was more than just trying to go to the award show. It was more than just fuck the hip hop awards. I don't care about that. I was trying to create and I was creating projects while I was there and they were giving me the most bullshit ass deals. You know what I'm saying? No doubt. (laughs) So you understand. That's why it's called bet. No, that's why I, call, I bet. No, it's called it's called bamboozle entertainment. No doubt. You know Were you over there on Fifty Seven? Yeah, I was on Fifty Seven, so, staying in the yeah, BMW building. Over there, yeah, yeah, yeah I absolutely. used to go and do stuff for that. Yeah, so there. you know, they they no one gave me an opportunity there, man. Mm-hmm. And I saw the regimes from the Stephen Hills to yep. the the, the Larethas to the Hutland. Reginald Hutlands. Yep. I, I was there through the whole thing, mm-hmm. and um, when Viacom took over, Viacom took over in two thousand, but when it really took over. And you start looking over and you don't see brown people anymore. It became Viacom. Viacom. Viacom Human yeah, Resources. You know that means it's white. Viacom, Viacom. Finances. <laughs> white people are sponsored by yeah. Viacom. Absolutely. It's real shit. It's real shit. And I remember being called in the conference room. I'm off probation. I did my three years and my 16 years there. And they said, oh, thank you for working. We don't really need you anymore because... You know, the company is downsizing, and they gave me $4,000 for 16 Holy years of severance. Holy yeah. shit. So I had to figure it out, man. I had wow. to figure it out real bad, like real fast. Real wow. fast. $4,000. $4,000 in severance, brother. And that's shit. when I realized that, you know, you know, everything black ain't right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, like, no. Real. It don't matter who yeah, sh- yeah. in this bitch. Yeah. Anybody can fuck. I mean, everybody's you. Black, expendable. Wh- you yeah, know? everybody it don't matter. Every, everybody. Black yeah. people shit on you. Yeah. Like, it does, it does everybody. Not everybody was. at all. So, um, I just you know I you know I I lived in Midtown at the time, and I, I had to look out my window and say, "How the fuck I'm gonna figure this shit out, man?" Damn. And I was still trying to push Godfather Harlem at the same time. Made That's a, what you. When did you start writing that? No, what I did, I packaged it. You packaged, okay. I packaged everything. Um, I did the research. I went to the Schomburg Museum and uh, uh. did everything. Like when I when you say writing, you have to bring something right. to the writer's room. Cause if you're in a writer's room with six people that are white that don't know who Bumpy Johnson is, where do they start from? You feel what I'm saying? <sighs> so I'm bringing everything from 
All the white story. writers, huh? No, no. We had a diverse <laughs> writing room. I'm just oh. saying for an example. Ooh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, but you know, you, you yeah, do have no folks like that. You know what I'm saying? That wouldn't know that. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. that's just like putting a bunch of black people writing an, an Italian story. If you don't bring that substance so they can learn, so that's what I had to do. And this is before I had a deal or anything like that. I had to package it to make sure it was okay. was the best package that could be. So when the writer's room was formed. That when you mean packaging, what do you what do you mean? Because some probably be like, what do you mean by packaging? Packaging meaning uh, setting it up like uh, writer, uh, star. Uh, oh, okay. Someone so of that sort. It, it's together. just it's almost it's almost so like. But you you're in Sean. What about Forrest Whitaker? Was he with you throughout that no, journey? No, it was no? just. Well, you're in Sean the Schaumburg Museum getting info on your grand your his grandmother, grandmother. godmother, and now you're getting this information. You're getting all this. But are you taking notes down? Or are you what? What are you doing? You're like it's just I'm just doing a story about Buckley no, no. Johnson. So, so what? It, I, what, yeah. what I what I did was I did a deep dive into who Ellsworth Raymond Johnson was mm. from the 1930s to the 40s, okay, and just grabbing newspaper gotcha. articles and uh, research, when, research, research, and when it wasn't any newspaper articles, sometimes we had to go into the archives, like. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Dewey Decimal System? Microfilm? No, not. <laughs> Microfilm. <laughs> Microfilm. Yeah. Microfilm. I got no Microfilm. terms. <laughs> so we, I had to do that just to make sure that the story I wanted to tell, like if you have a story, you can't just say, I want to I have a story to tell. You have to have everything. What do you have? What do yeah. you have can to we tell the story? Yes. You know what I mean? So um, that's what I did. Wow. And then, okay, you got all this. You packaged it up. Who are you? Who are you? Like, who's the first person you approached? Well, like I said, I had the story for 18 years. So what happened? Damn! Was, yeah. So what happened? See, ha- this shit take forever. People don't understand mm-hmm. how long this shit be taking. Yeah. Man, 18 years. 18 okay. Years. That is crazy. Oof. 18 years. Jesus. Man. 18 so, years. So um, one day I was sitting in uh in my um my apartment and I was with uh he's like my uncle. His name is Bernard Alexander. Okay. And uh Bernard is he used to manage 50 Cents, the Fugees, wow. Eric Sermon's best friend. And I was like, uh, I really got to get the story done, man. And I was depressed. So he introduced me to my partner. His name is James Atchison. Okay. And I never met James before. And I said on the phone, I said, yo, I said, James, you know, I got a story that I, I really have been working on for the last 18 years. And it's about a, uh, a gangster by the name of Bumpy Johnson because he was working on American Gangster with Frank Lucas. Because there was the Bumpy Johnson from when when um, Lawrence Fishburne, remember? That's Hoodlum. Hoodlum, Hoodlum. Yeah. right. And I'm about, when... to, I'm about to tell you some interesting okay. stuff. So um, he was like, yeah, I know who Bumpy Johnson is, but I found out he was lying. You know, he's a white boy from Boston. He just said that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so he just said that. But he, but he, became, he became my partner because... He actually flew out to New York, and we met for the first time, um, him and his wife, uh, Joanne Colano, and his son, Luca, and I brought them over to uh, Lennox Terrace to meet Margaret. And uh, they sat down with Margaret, and then I took him to Sylvia's. And we ate at Sylvia's. He was like, yo, we got to get this story done, right? So Margaret co-signed me, because Margaret was tough, man. Margaret is like, who the fuck is these white folks you got up at my motherfucking house? <laughs> And she just came from shooting somebody. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> the gun was still smoking? No, 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 no. What happened was Margaret it, was, used to ride this motorized wheelchair with a, right. a mangy poodle, right? <laughs> <laughs> and this, this Mary Poppins basket, right? Yeah, and yeah. Front. Everybody knows Margaret Johnson, right? So um, someone ran up on her and was like, yo, give me your money. And she took out a three fifty seven and shot him in the ass. <laughs> And in the elbow. That's so gangster. And, and he it. was at McDonald's leaking and tried to sue her. The cops came. She said she was on her way to the gun range. And the New York Post had her as the Granny Oakley. Like I love it. Like uh, oh, Annie Oakley. Annie That's Oakley. Dope. Granny Oakley. Hell yeah. 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 <laughs> so she was very, like, real serious about her shit. So when I bought them, she's like, who are these white folks? And then she got used to accustomed to them from talking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And she was like, yeah, these are the people that are going to be able to help you make it happen. And um, I basically had to bring the package that I put to the table. And I remember Jim calling me one day and he said, um, how would you feel about Forrest Whitaker playing uh, Lord, have mercy. Bumpy Johnson? Woo. I hung up the phone to him. 
<laughs> I say, man, because you know where I'm from, everybody's everybody has the Brooklyn Bridge or the Triborough Bridge. My my yeah. man is a shake with fifty million dollar movie slate and all that other shit. Right, you know right. what I'm saying? So he he called me back. He said, No, I'm serious because um he's about to come spend the night at the house. Turns out Forrest Whitaker. Yeah, turns out Jim's wife manages Forrest. Ain't that a bitch. And um Who's my older sister? Like like my older sister now, yeah. Joanne and Jim. They're my family. And then Forrest, you know, met me and took me under his wing like I was his little brother. And he didn't say that he wanted to play Bumpy Johnson. He just said he'll produce it with me. That's cool. But the reason why, as an actor, as actors, right? Yeah. You want to make sure that whoever's writing this, that you can portray that character. You know what I'm saying? You can't just say, I'm gonna do this if you don't know the way it's written. So for him co-signing and say, I want to be part of this, I had to find a writer. So um, they were sending me spec scripts from uh, UTA to CAA to William Morris. Everybody was sending me spec scripts and I was just reading these scripts. So one day I was up late at night and I was like, man, these scripts, is... I got to find the right writer. So I was looking through my favorite gangster movies because I'm an avid movie buff and I looked up Hoodlum. And I saw Chris Brancato and Paul Eckstein, and they did Hoodlum. So I called Jim. I said, yo, Jim, you know Chris Brancato? He said, who, the writer? I said, yeah. Oh, he lives right across the street from me. He comes over my house every Sunday, and Joanne cooks an Italian what dinner for What the me. fuck is this <laughs> fucking yeah. synchronicity? You see the synchronicity? Get the fuck out of here. That is synchronicity. It's just mm-hmm. fucking like stars Shit aligned. Balls in the plate. Hey, Italians hey. wouldn't know what it is. Like, you know what happens when the two you know, come the, together? The thing. And the things happen in the <laughs> spiritual <laughs> thing. Let's get some limoncello and yeah. some guapa <laughs> and just. <laughs> it's like when you make a perfect sauce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, right? Exactly. So, um, he spoke to Chris the next day. Chris mm-hmm. said, oh, we did Bumpy Johnson already, man. I, I, I'm i working on a project called La Serena's on CBS. You know, it's a pilot. Uh, I don't know if I can do it. So Jim said, uh, okay, let me call Marquan back. He called me back. He said, yeah, Chris is working on something. I said, what about Paul? Paul is the other individual that produced Hoodlum. Paul said, hell yeah. His mm-hmm. name is Paul Eckstein. So, um... Paul flew out to New York to come see me, and I'm thinking I'm going to see this crazy, this 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 Jewish guy coming down the block saying, "Hey, I know Bumpy Johnson. <laughs> Bumpy sold me some jewelry. I know it, that's right, sir. I remember him. <laughs> but that guy had a lot of silk. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> no velvet, velvet. <laughs> but Paul, Paul is African American. His father was Jewish, and his mother's black. And oh. Bumpy actually put his grandmother through secretarial school. So we sat down there and um yeah. Damn. Wow. He was wow. like, Yeah, Crazy. I wanna do it. So myself and Paul, we started working on the script for like six months, man. Six months. And I remember flying, I, you know, a lot of people want success, Godfrey, but people aren't ready to eat tuna fish sandwiches. They ain't ready for the smoke. People, people Real ain't, talk. People ain't ready to eat ramen noodles. Real talk. People not ready to sleep on somebody's floor Real when they can't afford talk. a hotel. People Whew. are not ready Not people are not people ready to say, hey, yo, Aish, you got to hook up with Buddy Passes because I got a meeting at Netflix and I got to get out on Sunday to no. this meeting at Netflix Man, on Monday. No money. You know what I'm saying? They ain't ready. And, and I remember laying down on garages, like cold floors, and just working on the script with Paul, you know, and just trying to make it back and forth, you know, to L.A. And um, Chris eventually said, all right, all right, I'm going to be part of this, but the way that we have to tell this story, because Chris created Narcos. So so the way we want to play this story is um, we want to talk about Bumpy coming home from jail in 1963 in one of the most turbulent times in America. Cause we did the Harlem Renaissance, you know, with the zoot suits and yeah. the and the and the flapper girls. Yeah. So um Chris got on board and um Disney offered me a deal. So Disney gave me a a, a, a deal. Tracy Underwood and Pat Moran was over there. And I remember sitting in the office in Burbank and they told me, they said, um, in order for you to get this show sold and star in it, you might as well get struck by lightning twice. Sure. 
I got struck by lightning twice. I'm here talking to you about it right now. How you like that? You know what I'm saying? And How I remember you like that. I remember we got turned down by three networks because WME represented the project. And um, I tell people all the time, man, don't look at my glory. Listen to my story. Don't look at my breakthrough. Look what I've been through. Mm. Because imagine sitting in a room with an Academy, Academy Award winning actor, an Emmy Award winning writer, right? And you got executives right there. Like Forrest is, Forrest is my big brother. He was in every pitch meeting with me. Chris Brancato, every pitch meeting with me. What has Chris done? He created the biggest show on Netflix, Narcos. What has Forrest done? Academy Award winning from Fast Time Original or Last King of Scott. Brian, get plop, plop, plop. <laughs> and we got, we got turned down. We got turned down three times. We got turned down by Netflix. We got turned down by Apple. I got turned down by stars twice. Wow. I got turned down by star twice when Ari Emanuel walked me back into the room uh, with Chris Albert and he said, Joe, you got to listen to this show. This this is something that really needs to be done. And I remember, um, this was November, around the same time, yeah. and I was feeling depressed because I had to come back to New York to figure it out. I mean, I didn't have a job. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't want to go back to the streets, man. And um, I remember... Christmas passed and New Year's came and I got an email from my showrunner who said, Chris said, this was a noble failure. I said, a fucking noble failure? What Shakespearean type shit is this? I ain't fucking King Arthur. To learn how to die. No, fuck this. I'm not King Arthur. You died well. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, he could go back and you can go and do Sherlock Holmes 2 with Robert Downey Jr., and get fed by his private chef in the Hamptons. Forrest could go get his next Academy Award. I didn't have a safety net. This had to happen for me. And um, I remember a junior agent at WME was like, there's a new person that just came into Epics named Michael Wright. Michael had came from Steven Spielberg's company, Amblin Entertainment. And um, I, I didn't have any money to make it back out to LA to uh, do the meeting, but Michael was like, I need to do this meeting because I like the script. So Forrest and Paul and, and Chris went in, and I remember being at my mom's house, and my mother was like, baby, won't you try something else? I'm looking at my mother like, huh? I turned off my phone. Went to get a haircut, I was just laying on the, on the couch. And I said, fuck it, I'm gonna turn back on my phone. I went into the car and I saw seven missed calls. Forrest kept calling me. And he said, why are you not picking up your phone? I said, what's up, man? He said, you ready to play your character? He said, we just sold it in the room. I went upstairs and I DDT'd my mother like, you motherfucker! <laughs> wow, yeah. man, man. <laughs> man. I was like, ah! Let me give you some horn. <laughs> she had a concussion like this. <laughs> that yeah. is, yeah. you talk about perseverance. Yeah, man. 